Welcome to the second installment from the Cromarty Firth. In this video, I'll be exploring one of the First World War 4 inch quick firing emplacements and magazines. Making these videos is a learning process, and as you'll see, some of my initial assumptions were incorrect, and I've had to correct myself after carrying out further research. I hope this doesn't spoil your enjoyment of the video, so please sit back and join me at North Suter Battery. Hello YouTube and welcome to a sunny Cromarty Firth. I'm at North Suter Battery. This is a First World War um, battery that was crewed by the Royal Navy and it housed four four inch quick firing guns. They were mounted in two pairs and what we're going to look at this video is going round one of these pairs, one of these twin emplacements. So quick firing four inch guns. You can see Cromarty Firth, quite a narrow stretch of water. Um, standard um, six inch or higher, 9.2 inch coastal artillery would have been too large a caliber um, and too slow firing to attack any fast moving patrol vessels or boats that managed to slip the naval and coastal artillery net uh, and made the way um, into the Firth. So quick firing guns would have uh, would have been able to engage those fast moving craft. So this pair of emplacements uh, with not much protection as you'll see um, other than what was fitted to the, the gun itself. So each pair of guns um, had a subterranean magazine cut into the rock um, and there was a single battery observation post um, serving both of them. So we're now going to descend into the, the magazines you can see above the roof there's a um, an iron uh, an iron roof in place and that would, would most likely have had corrugated iron uh, mounted to it just for some weather protection. I'm sure it gets very wet and cold up here. So what we can see is here we have this incredible condition steel door um, that was protecting the lamp recess. So inside here we have the magazine uh, where the ammunition was stored. Um, you couldn't of course bring uh, naked flames or lights into the magazine. Um, so they had to be lit externally with a pane of glass on the inside. Uh, your lamp would have been uh, placed in that recess. Uh, there's a second one down in the that little room at, at the end. Um, on a lot of these uh, emplacements you would see a um, a davit or a small crane for hoisting um, ammunition down into the magazine but in this case uh, there is no crane so it can be assumed that all the ammunition was hand loaded uh, down those steps. So this is a window into um, what I think must have been the crew shelter uh, with steel bars for protection on the outside as well as the, uh, the original cast iron uh, window frame on the inside. So we'll head on in. So we're in the first room, which is the crew shelter. In the first of two corrections in this video, I have called this a crew shelter, while on Canmore it's recorded as a shell store. There are a number of reasons for this. The first is that it was not uncommon for quick firing guns, even of four inch calibre, to utilise fixed ammunition, i.e. the cartridge was fixed to the shell and not loaded separately. This would have resulted in only one magazine being required. The next is that the absence of a shell lift resulted in all ammunition being carried to the gun from the magazines up those stairs. This would have required considerable manpower. There was also no other hardened accommodation at the battery, so in the event the guns came under fire, the crews would have needed somewhere to shelter. Now, back to the video. And there's some, some nice uh, original graffiti, James Durno, uh, January 1940. 
and some larger chalk names. 1931, W. Gordon, V. Stewart, A. Allen, Rossshire, Moorish. So, locals coming down here after the First World War, some more recent. So quite a lot of quite a lot of graffiti left. Robert Knox, John Spence, 1940, 1944, RAF and a and a WAF. Maybe down here celebrating the end of the war. Or he did at least. And then we come in to the magazine. Very simple room, one ventilation shaft up top, two lamp recesses, one of which we saw earlier. And the sole purpose of this room was to protect the ammunition, keep it dry, protect it from fire the battery cumulative attack. An interesting feature that we often find on, on these magazines are the door fixtures and fittings you can see as they're um, corroding copper the non-sparking, non-ferrous metal. Uh, we can also see at the very top of the door frame was a recess, suggesting that there were two. The door was split in half, and it would have opened up uh, both ways, and it was pinned then centrally. And very thick walls and high, high quality, high quality concrete in the First World War, as opposed to the more economy concrete mixes that were used. Yeah, use later. And finally we have this room, and I'm not, yeah, not exactly certain what purpose this sort of serves. So everything I say in this section is wrong. Uh, after doing some research when I got home, I realised this was the telephone box. I've annotated some of the features on the screen that will hopefully give you an idea of how it functioned and what it looked like. Judging by the pipes up in the roof work, it would have served a later, um, a later purpose. Not necessarily reusing the battery, but possibly just uh, using this room. Well, it looks like a probably a light put or what may have been used as a chimney or exhaust for some some boiler. <laughs>